All right, so today we're in Love and Torah Part 35. <laughs> and for the third time, we'll go through verses 14 through 17. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, so to be safe, we're not going to do a recap because that's where we get stuck sometimes. Somebody said to me, okay, so you did part 33, and then you did part 33 2.0 or something, or B. <laughs> part A and part B, yes, the B was for you. Okay, so we are gonna recap this part, okay? So the concept is, we're looking at the connection between the, you know, the understanding of what love is and the Torah. Of course, Yahweh says Elohim is love. And the Torah, we know, is the expression of his love, and it's also the way that we can become and understand what it means to become him, how we become him. It's the transformative aspect of what he's given us. It's the vehicle to transform from what we are into what he is. And so he gives us, through Yeshua, the two great commands which encompass the whole concept of love, which is loving Elohim and loving each other. Now, of course, we've covered a lot of both of these up to this point, and we were going through Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to continue there, and we're going to have such a good time because we're going to deal with everybody's favorite subject, love of the husband and the wife. Ooh. Okay, so the key section here, let's just, just do a little recap. In chapter 5, the point is to be imitators of Elohim. We're just going to, that's the only recap we're going to do here. Become imitators of Elohim. Hopefully all of you have been paying attention to all the previous 34 parts and you kind of know where we're going. Okay, so we're to become imitators of Elohim and walk in love as Messiah also loved us. And that's going to be repeated here and towards the end of the chapter when we're dealing with the way a husband is supposed to act and the way a wife is supposed to act. So let's begin as he's transitioning from this contrast between darkness and light and our behavior when we were disobedient and, un and didn't know anything, we're outside of the covenant, outside of things, with those that are now in and waking up and being more diligent, verse 14. And then we get to this interesting transition. Before we get to husbands and wives, which is verse 22, he says, and do not be drunk, in verse 18, with wine in which loose behavior, uh, in which is loose behavior, but be filled with the Spirit. So he's trying to say, okay, I've given you some contrasts. I want you to have the appropriate uh, mindset and conditioning that's necessary emotionally and, and mentally and physically. We'll get the spiritual part there in a minute to have appropriate relationships. Things like being drunk uh, hamper that ability, interfere with your capacity to do that. You know, we talked about this during uh, the Zone 2 meeting that we did earlier today. Um, you guys who weren't there, it doesn't matter, but and whoever's listening to this is like, what is he talking about? Well, we do have some international meetings that we do, and in that, one of the things we were talking about, and I also talked about this with the academy, uh, high schoolers and middle schoolers, is understanding that, and this is where the, the drunkenness thing's gonna come in. Making decisions is the reason you're here. We have a teaching called that, right? Making decisions is the reason you exist. So what's the problem and what's the challenge in making decisions? And why am I bringing this up now with this drunkenness thing? Well, the challenge is that the way decisions are made is based on the preferences that you have. And that's where your emotions come in. I like that or I don't like that. I want that or I don't want that. And the challenge that wraps this all together is the emotions like to grab the steering wheel and drive. And they also like to jam your foot on the brake or on the accelerator, even if that's not what you want to be doing. And you need to, though, have the mind of Messiah, Philippians 2.5, control that whole emotional mess. Now, there's nothing wrong with preferences. You should have some preferences. I like something and I don't like something. And that's okay, everybody's allowed to have preferences. But what happens when your preference interferes with something that you should or need to do? In other words, you don't wanna do it, but you know you need to, or you know you shouldn't, but you wanna do it, but you know you shouldn't. What wins out? Well, the one with the stronger emotional motivator, okay? This is why Paul says, that which I want to do, I don't do. And that which I don't want to do, I do. 
because he's struggling with the emotional motivators and the mind overriding. Think of it more like, instead of like a bus driver and you know, the, the feet and the heart of the emotions pushing the pedals and grabbing the wheel, think of it more like the captain of a ship. You've got all these people in the ship that are there to make sure to get the engines going or to steer and everything else, but you gotta tell who to do what. Slow down, speed up, turn left, turn right. The problem is you're being led by the emotional side instead of you taking control over that. Okay, this is important as we get into verse 18. So let me just make sure we've set that up. You have, as a human being, preferences. You're supposed to have preferences. There's nothing wrong with them. I mean, this is the same example that I give to the children. Okay, today is April the 10th. And let's say, well, it's a Sabbath. So let's say I was saying this yesterday, so it was the 9th. And let's say I gave you an assignment that's due June 1st. Well, that's a long time from now. So are you going to feel much urgency to work on it this weekend or next week or whatever? Probably not. How about on May 31st? Okay, you're gonna be like, whoa, I need to get this thing started. Because now what happened between April 9th and May 30th or 31st? The leverage of the motivator switched. The I don't want to do, which was a fairly strong motivator, and I'd rather do something else, shifts to if I don't do, bad things are going to happen, like maybe an F on my paper or my project. So now I'm motivated to I better do it because I'm now running away from the F. I don't want to get a failing grade. And so when you are faced with some Torah observant issues, the same thing is happening. You know, you have a family member say, you know, my daughter's getting married on whatever date, and you realize it's a Saturday, and I'd like you to stand up at the wedding. And you're like, uh, it's a Saturday. Well, now your emotional preferences are gonna happen. I really have a close relationship with my family, and I really love my nephew or niece who's getting married, and wait, but Yahweh says no, and it's my day, and you shouldn't do that. And so we're, we're struggling emotionally inside. And this could be applied to almost anything that you're dealing with. Okay? As a matter of fact, almost every time I watch what you guys do and you guys fail is because I'm watching you fail emotionally. There's so many things I've told you guys were not, by the way, when I say I told you guys, I didn't tell you to do or not to do. When I told you something is wisdom and something is foolishness that you shouldn't do, I get disappointed when you do what you shouldn't do or when you don't do what you should do, but that doesn't mean that I dictatedly, you know, in a dictator way said to you, do this or don't do that. That's what he does, not me. He gets to say, do this and don't do that. But I watch you fail because you let the emotional drivers grab the wheel and you're not overriding them. You're not captain of your ship, okay? And that's where you really run into the struggle. Now I said all of that because then it says here, do not be drunk with wine, because when you're drunk with wine, you have even less control. You're not driving anything. <laughs> the emotions are being let loose out of the, you know, the jail doors are open, the barn doors are open, and everything's just running amok. Because what little challenge and, and, and control you might have had gets loosened up by alcohol and drugs and other things, okay? So he's saying here, look, this battle between, verse eight, you were once darkness, but now you're light. Well, the emotional part of you still liked the things that were in darkness and still wants to pull you back in that direction. Not that all emotions are about darkness. You got really excited and emotional when you found out about the light. But you haven't been living in the light your whole life. And so there's still things that pull you emotionally towards those things in the darkness. He's saying, look, if you add wine to the mix, this is really gonna be a problem if you get drunk. Now it's not about just having a glass of wine. And I think I've said this in the past, I think I said it even last week, but the problem is some of you guys still are getting drunk. And that's when you certainly are losing your control of driving the ship. You're no longer the captain, okay? So we need to not be doing that. He says, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Okay, be filled with the ruach, the love, the joy, the things of above, the fullness of how he intended things to be. He says, speaking to each other in psalms and songs of praise and spiritual songs, singing and striking the strings in your heart to the master. 
giving thanks always for all, to El- uh, for all to Elohim the Father in the name of our Master Yeshua Messiah. Subjecting yourselves to each other in the fear of Elohim. Okay, so now we're framing this before we get to wives. Okay, because it starts right there. And then it goes husbands. So we're framing this. What's the beginning framework? We didn't come from the right place. We weren't taught the right things. We were in darkness. We were disobedient. We were part of the sons of disobedience, the spirit of disobedience. We were without Elohim in the world, Ephesians chapter two, all of those things. And then we have now been brought into a different place, which means that probably almost every aspect of our lives needs a reset. Maybe some parts less, some parts more, but almost every aspect of your life is going to need a reset how you approach your job, how you approach your relationship if you're married, how you approach your parents, how you approach your children, okay, how you approach ministry people or even coworkers and friends. All of the things in your life, what you eat, when you eat, whether you eat, like Yom Kippur, you don't eat, right? I mean, all kinds of things are going to go into reset. So at this point, we're going to be using the husband-wife metaphor, and it's a literal and a metaphor for a bigger picture, for the whole point that's being made here by Shaul to the Ephesians. Because he's saying, now look, don't be foolish, but understand the desire of Yahweh, that's verse 17. He says, and don't get all drunk, don't get all, you know, dampen your, 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 your um, ability to make decisions by letting the emotions just run rampant. He says, but rather, Fill yourself with the Spirit and speak all the enthusiastically positive things. Speak to each other psalms and songs of praise and encouragement. All these kind of things that should be striking in the strings of your heart. Problem is most of us are frustrated. Most of us are filled with anxiety and fear and all these other things because we've not gotten our mind to control the emotional challenge. And we're all emotionally challenged. If we weren't, we would never break the commandments. We would never have these issues in our lives because it's the emotion that causes the problem. And when I say emotion, I mean it's your preferences. But I want, but you're not supposed to have it, but I want it. Or I know I'm supposed to do that, but I don't want to do it. And you're not gonna make me do it, I don't want to do that. And that's where we have the challenge. And at some point, you need to rule so that you can then hand over that authority. Now, I know I haven't, I, I've said it a few times, but maybe not enough. Yes, we need to get off the throne. My daughter sang that today in the song during the praise time, right? We have to get off the throne. Actually, she heard me saying that to someone once on a phone call in the car. She used it, in a, so she had to write a song about it. Yes, you have to get off that self-sovereign throne. But you know what? You can't really, if you don't actually have the throne, you're, you're not actually the one sitting on it in the first place. All right? It's kind of like me going over and trying to sell your house to somebody when it's not my house. Okay? You can't hand over something to someone that you don't actually have authority over. So you need to start to rule and reign in your own life and then hand that to Yeshua. But you can't do that if you're going to allow your preferences and your desires and your cravings, those emotional things, to leverage you in the wrong way. And some of you think, well, how do I beat that? I used the key word there at the end there, leverage. See, your emotions are already trying to leverage you. Well, I don't like that. And the stronger you don't like it, the more it leverages you to try to find some way to avoid it. The more you want something, the more you're gonna get leveraged to want and go figure out a way to have it. This is kind of where a lot of the cheating comes from. Okay, you weren't planning it, you weren't thinking about it, you met somebody, the next thing you know, you start really liking and enjoying their company and desiring them, and then you start trying to figure out a way to have what you want. And you usually go about it the wrong way. Because if you're married, you can't do that. So now you're thinking, okay, I'm married, so now I've got this emotional problem. I'm married, not real happy with my spouse, kinda happy with this other person, can't have both, how do I work that out? And it's the emotional leverage that will get you to take action one way or the other. See, this is what we're gonna be dealing with with this husband-wife thing here in a few seconds. 
And so you need to understand that you, this is back to person, no, we're back to uh, group therapy, right? You have full ability and no restraints from being able to leverage yourself on purpose. You can change the leverage around. What do you think is a commercial or an advertisement? It's a company trying to leverage you emotionally in a direction they want. There is no reason that it's necessary to have scantily clad women in beer commercials. Except that most of the people drinking are men and they want the men to think, if I drink this beer, I get the girl. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's an emotional leverage. It's a lie. And so the companies that make commercials want you to believe that if you get their product, amazing things will happen or your problems will be solved. And if you don't, your life will suck, basically. <laughs> okay? You'll be missing out on something. And they leverage you emotionally. Now, notice that you don't generally see a commercial once and never see it again. Because you can't leverage somebody with one imprint. And you wonder why you still struggle. Because you worked at it for five minutes and it didn't fix and then you stopped. Well, it took you 30, 40, 60 years to get where you are. Why are you gonna think you're gonna fix it in a week? I gave some people, when I counsel, I give people some techniques to work with these things. And one time I gave these techniques to one person. He said, oh, that doesn't work. I tried it. Now, some of you would have thought like, oh, wow. Now, of course, I've done this in more than five minutes, so I immediately asked the question. You tried it? Okay, describe to me what you did. The person didn't try it. They did it for like two days and it didn't do anything. I said, this is not supposed to work in two days. This, you'll be lucky to get any results in two months. But you, if you do it consistently, you'll get some definite results within three, four, five months. Because you're reprogramming a brain and an emotion and a heart and a behavior pattern that's been going in a certain direction for 37 years, and now you're gonna fix it in two days. It's not gonna happen. Anybody ever go to the chiropractor for the first time you ever went to a chiropractor, the chiropractor fixed you once and said, okay, you're done, you never have to come back? Because you, usually they say, you need to come back tomorrow or the next day because what I just did won't take that well initially. It takes a while to keep readjusting the body till it eventually integrates the change. See, you need to go, if you're going to go from who you are to what he is, that change doesn't naturally integrate into your system. Oh, I know you came out of Christianity and you'd love to think he's going to wave his magic wand in hand or whatever, blink at you or do the genie thing and blink or whatever. And all of a sudden, your stony heart is going to turn to flesh and you're just going to be what? No, you're going to still be you. You've got to change into him. That doesn't happen so simply. It doesn't matter that your mindset's now different and you understand things differently. The behavior doesn't automatically follow. Now, there were things that you weren't very strongly emotional about that were easy. I grew up in a Jewish home that ate anything, kept nothing, all that kind of stuff. But I never liked pork, shellfish, lobster, any of that stuff, shrimp. I never liked it. So guess what? When I realized that it was really unclean and I shouldn't eat it, I was like, that was easy. That took no effort because already I wasn't eating it. Didn't like it. Now some of you have a love affair with your whatever unclean thing that you liked. That's a little bit more challenging. That's not to say there wasn't other areas of my life that I had more emotions to, but you need to understand, to integrate all these changes, some will be simple, some will take an incredible amount of consistent effort. Because some of you come to me and you're all depressed and frustrated because you're still doing, it's like, I can't seem to overcome this thing. Well, it takes a while. How long have you had that problem? 45 years? I mean, you expect that to fix right away? You're already on the right path. You recognize that you need to change. I mean, that's the first thing. You have to recognize the need to change. All right, so good. Now, the next thing to do is get counsel on things to do to start developing new habits and to actually integrate change. So you might need to go get help or study. There's lots of great books, lots of great videos, lots of great, lots of things free on YouTube about personal development and growth and all those things. 
Especially if you know exactly where your weakness is, you can look that specific thing up and learn everything you need to know about. I've told you, become an expert in your problem. Not an expert so you're great at doing the problem, but you understand it so that you can learn all the possible solutions to your problem. Okay? I mean, this is something that's important. You know, if people would have done that with this COVID thing, they would have learned that there are certain things that you could have taken naturally that certainly would have helped, even if it wouldn't have fixed the problem, instead of just listening to one talking head on TV. All right? Because all of a sudden now they're telling everybody vitamin D3 is good for this. Well, you could have figured that out last year. Okay? because they weren't going to tell you that last year. But other people were. You could do the research. So wherever your challenge is, you need to learn then how do I become enough, um, become informed enough so I can make the integration changes necessary to change from what I am into where I want to be. And where you want to be is you want to become him. All right? And so that's really the critical thing as we're going forward here because as I'm going to now talk to you about this idea of husbands and wives, all of you are doing this badly to some degree. We all struggle. It's all challenging, you know. Like I said, I think last week, I said, I wonder sometimes why he, why did he ever invent marriage? It, we, we're terrible at this thing. And it's really because we as two screwed up individuals come together thinking that that's gonna integrate. That's like you walking your life out and now you come to find Yeshua and think that somehow naturally that's just gonna integrate. You can't do that in yourself. Now you're gonna have two people not doing it themselves trying to come together? Of course that's gonna be a struggle. And a lot of it's because when we look at the things when it comes to things like these kind of relationships, you know, there's not a lot of stuff in here specifically other than Torah keeping that explains this relationship vertically except what you learned in church or you learned from some group of how to love him. Well, the same thing with husbands and wives. Most of you understand husbands and wives from basically three places, watching your parents, watching your friend's parents, and what church people might have told. Somebody in some system might have told you that's what a wife does, that's what a husband does. And they will have used terms that we're going to use today that you don't understand right. And I know you don't because I know they taught it wrong. Because I know what they've taught. I've seen all those videos. I've heard the pastors and preachers. Because people have said to me, oh, when we first got married, my wife and I, people would send us, you know, hey, this is a great preacher, teacher about marriage stuff. And a lot of these guys don't have any idea what they're talking about. Now, the, there's one or two out there that are not trying to do it from a Christianized, Bible-based way that are helping you really understand how women think and how men think, and they're, they're pretty good. But other than that, they don't know, and the key word starts right out there with submit. So they don't understand the two roles, the authority role and the submission role at all. There's, like, there's just no understanding of that. Which, by the way, is our biggest problem in both of the, of the two great commands. Loving him requires understanding authority and submission and loving each other under, have to understand authority and submission. Two cannot walk together unless they agree. They don't have to agree about what they're walking. They have to agree how they're walking. See, the church might say, oh, no, you have to agree. No, we have to agree about how we walk. I walk with the Father. He does not need to agree with me. I need to agree with him. Okay, so it's not one of those where there's a give and take and we're going to come to an agreement. The agreement is, he talks, I follow. That's that relationship. Husband and wife's a little bit different. Parent and a child, a little bit different. As a matter of fact, parent and child changes when they get to a certain age because what you did when they were five, you can't do when they're 16 and 17. The relationship by its nature does change. Okay? And so this is really what we're trying to get to here. So he leads into this really nice, oh, sing songs and strike the strings in your heart and, and giving thanks always to Elohim the Father and subjecting yourselves to each other in the fear of Elohim. Wives, whoa, 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 what happened? Okay, all of a sudden, it's like the whole tone switches. <laughs> so it's, he says, subjecting yourselves to each other in the fear of Elohim. So let's start off, before we turn to submission, the idea of subjecting, it starts with that it's being done in a particular way. 
Okay? Why, before we even get to why, it says, it says, subjecting yourselves to each other in the fear of Elohim. What does that mean? How Elohim would have you do it. Now, subjecting yourselves to each other doesn't mean a circle, kumbaya, we're all equal, we're all just singing, and whatever. Each relationship has a different requirement if you fear Elohim. How you treat a person, depending on where they are in the structure, you should know how Elohim sees it, and then with the fear of Elohim, you work with that. But yet, we don't. We want to, all of us want to believe that I am equal to everybody else, and I have just as much say no matter, my, no matter what my relationship is. And that's still why you don't do what Yahweh says to do at times. Because you think your opinion matters. And in some relationships, it does. In others, it doesn't. With Elohim, it doesn't. Okay? Your opinion carries zero weight in the covenant. Now, all the rest of the below relationships, your opinion does matter. But because it matters doesn't mean you always get your way. It just means your opinion matters. It has value. People should care to hear what your opinion is. All right, now, we'll get into why that still causes a problem and how it plays forward. So now we get to verse 22. Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the master. Now notice it starts off, subject yourselves to your own husbands. Stop listening to other husbands. Stop listening to other, th subject yourself to your own husband. And by the way, ladies, stop comparing your husband to other husbands. That is just awful. I can't even think of the right word I want to say for that. It's just wrong on every level. And I'll get to the husband, stop comparing your wives to other wives too. Yours is yours, and you only know a tiny little bit about everybody else's while you know a huge amount about yours. And you're gonna compare what you know about yours, this huge amount that you know about your spouse, to the tiny little bit in public that you know about the other one. Because you just don't know, but you think you know. Well, so-and-so's wife does this, or so-and-so's husband does that, or why can't you be more like, don't do that to your kids either. Well, I notice that so-and-so you know, has a son your age, behaves different, a daughter behaves different. Or Don't compare. Any of you like being compared to anybody? Nobody does. Let's just live in reality. None of us likes to be compared to anybody else. We have one comparison scripturally. You compare you, you compare you to him. I don't compare you to him. The next person sitting next to you doesn't compare you to him. You compare you to him. Okay? Your, your wife is your wife. Your husband is your husband. Your children are your children. And you don't need to say, why can't you be more alike? If you don't like what they're doing, say, I really don't like what you're doing. I would really prefer you did something else. Don't say, why can't you be more like? Because now you've completely rejected them and said, you like them better, prefer them better, and you have rejected them. Instead of saying, this thing you're doing in our relationship and I love you dearly, I don't like it. It needs to be fixed, it needs to be adjusted, we need to fix that, but this is you and me, not me being disappointed and wishing I had somebody else. Very important here. Wives, so you're gonna subject yourself to your own husbands. The Greek there has the understanding of acknowledging and submitting under authority. Okay, recognizing, now it says subject yourselves to each other in the fear of Elohim. So you need to have that, they, the way they want you to do this is with the same awe and reverence for authority. Ladies, don't, I'm, listen, I know your husbands may be struggling and they're not wherever they need to be yet, but he's yours and you need to own that. But you, you and I'm gonna to talk to the guys the same way, you do not, you do not have an excuse to say, I don't have to do it because he's not doing. He's talking to you when he says, you need to subject yourselves to your husbands. But he's not, blah, blah. Then get a divorce, because if he's your husband, you need to do this. That's what it says. 
Wives, submit to your husbands. He says, because the husband is head of the wife. I've been to some therapy people out there and talked to other people out there and they want to make it sound like there's an equal thing here. There's no equality here. I'm not talking about value. There's no more value in a man than a woman. There's none. You are equal in value. However, structurally to function in the walking together in agreement, it says the husband is the head of the wife. That's an authority structure. Okay, when we talked about our metaphor, I didn't realize it was going to play out so nicely into here. The emotions, kind of from the heart, driving, you know, our feet pushing the pedals, the brakes and the gas and everything else. What's supposed to regulate and have authority over all that emotional stuff? The head. Ladies, generally speaking, you have a higher level of emotional stuff. Not always. I got a bunch of men that think they're women, okay? And I don't mean that in a transgender confused way. I mean, they are now losing the understanding of where they need to be in that a driver, emotional, um, intellectually controlling emotional place where they're not running amok because their emotions are all over the place. And then that, and they wonder why their wives are having such a struggle. Is that because you're not providing them with any kind of a strength of leadership and guidance where your emotions are under control? Okay, ladies, the husband is supposed to be the head of the wife. Now notice the way he's giving you for the men to, to understand what this looks like. As, what does as mean? In the same manner as, like. Okay, this is what it's supposed to look like. The husband is head of the wife, just like Messiah is head of the assembly. Okay, let's stop right there before we get to the rest of the sentence. That is reality, even though it might not be in all of your marriages. Now, your marriages are going to be all a mess if you can't get to this place. Now, don't worry, ladies. I'm going to get on the guys plenty when we get there. All right? But you need to understand. This is still about that love and Torah thing, right? We're supposed to love one another. It starts in the most innermost relationship of loving each other, which is husband-wife. Then it extends out to parent-child, then it extends out to people outside of your house. But it starts with everybody inside your house. We even have the example, Yeshua says, in my father's house. There's many rooms, and guess what? There's a relationship with people in that house, and there's a headship, and there's an authority that needs to be respected in that house. And most of you have houses where there is no authority. It's nothing but disrespect for authority. And I'm not just talking about the wives, the children too. And men, I'm going to blame you the most when I get to you because you let it happen. You have let that happen, and so own it. All right? Now, so let's get back to this. So, when it says, do this as Messiah. So how is Messiah? Now remember, the wives are supposed to look at their husbands as an authority figure like they look to Messiah in the assembly. Now we're going to talk to the husbands and say, then you need to behave like Messiah does towards the assembly. So it's going to go both ways. All right? Because a lot of you are thinking, my husband is anywhere near like Messiah. He's never going to get there if you don't believe him. I said, ladies, do you understand that your number one job is help mate to the husband? Which means you are to help him, believe in him, encourage him, support him, even when he doesn't believe in himself. But that's hard. Oh, yeah, it is. There's not a single thing about this that isn't, that isn't hard. If anybody's been married for more than five minutes, you know this is hard. I mean, it has its moments where it's not so hard, but it, there's definitely hard aspects about it. And by the way, but while you're thinking about how tough it is to be married to him, think about how wonderful it might be to be married to you. <laughs> and vice versa. You may be thinking, oh man, my wife, what about you? None of us are, you know, are a great prize <laughs> from that point of view. Oh, we're a fantastic prize from other points of view, don't get me wrong, but from that point of view, get the shirt, wear it, own it, okay? While you're dealing with them, they're dealing with you. All right, so. Wives have to subject themselves to their husbands as the way they would subject themselves to Messiah. Wow, that's asking a lot. 
Oh yeah, he's asking a lot of both sides. We're only dealing with the wives first because that's the order was written, all right? But he gives you a reason. He says, Cause the, because the husband is the head of the wife. <clears throat> Not in America mostly, or anywhere else in the world for sure. Some cultures that are still sort of not caught up with the times, which is actually good for them. But in most modern day cultures, you know, 21st century, these people don't have this. The ladies do not, they just don't have this understanding to look to a husband with that level of respect. Respect. If, if Messiah was in the room, with you and talking, would you be talking? No. Would you talk over him? No. Would you interrupt him? No. If Messiah was disciplining somebody else in the room, would you jump in and tell him that he's doing it wrong or that the different thing is? But see, we don't have that today. What we have is out of control blue women, and if you know the color code what I'm talking about, who they're not doing it right and I need to jump in and interfere with what my husband's doing. Well, then talk to him privately and see if he's willing to take some counsel and advice. But don't control him and dictate to him on what he needs to do. You know, I said earlier that your opinion matters. Did I say that earlier in this part of the teaching? Okay. Ladies, understand this. Your husbands want your opinion. They would like you to share your information with them. What they don't want necessarily is for you to tell them what to do with it. I'd like to hear what my wife knows about what's happening in the house or what's happening with the kids or whatever it is that I might not know. What I don't necessarily want is her to tell me how I'm supposed to now handle that. Because that's now my responsibility, okay? Now she may say something like, can I make a suggestion? And I say, yes, that's still information, okay? But I still get to then decide how to do whatever I'm gonna do with that information. See, that's really hard for you ladies, though. All right? I had a lady one time leave the congregation said, accuse me of hating women. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you don't listen. I said, what do you mean you don't listen? She said, remember we talked about this thing a while back, and you said you were going to do whatever? And, well, you never did it. I was like, I thought we had a conversation. You had made a suggestion of something you thought we should do. I told you I thought it was a good idea. We might do it someday. And you're angry with me because I didn't obey you. Because I didn't do with the information. So because I didn't do, ladies, if the husband doesn't do with the information what you want, that doesn't mean he doesn't love you or respect you or appreciate you. It just means he made a different choice than you would. That's hard. You need to hear that again. If you give advice, guidance, information to your husband and he chooses to ignore it, do something different, whatever it is that he does, that does not mean that you are being disrespected, dishonored, and treated as if your opinion doesn't matter. He has reasons, hopefully. I mean, he definitely has reasons. It could be one of those emotional reasons. I didn't want to do it. I didn't like it. I mean, it may not be a good reason, but he has reasons. And he's allowed to. And guys, your wife is allowed to have an opinion. So let her have an opinion. But ladies, understand the difference between an opinion and then having an emotional investment in the thing that you gave your husband so that now you expect that he's going to do what you said. That's gonna get you in a lot of trouble. That's not gonna go well. Ladies, you all know, I could ask you to raise your hands, has that ever worked and gone well? No, okay? Even if you forced him to do what you wanted, it still didn't go well. Because now you got a husband that is no longer feeling like he's in a right relationship because you're now leading and forcing the issue. Ladies, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the master. Why? Because he's the head of the wife. This isn't gray. Okay? There is a vertical structure here. But he's head in the same way that Messiah is head of the assembly. All right? And he is savior of the body. Your husband's supposed to be the savior of the house, of the family, the protector, the provider. You're the support structure. He's the provider protector. And some of you are thinking, he hasn't provided nothing for years. That's a problem. We'll get to that with the guys in the, at some point here. 
But that's the role. Thing is, you didn't know that when you got married. Nobody told you these things. You weren't looking for the right thing when you got married, both the guys and the ladies. The guys weren't looking for a helpmate who's just going to believe in them and support them and encourage them. And the ladies weren't looking for a guy who was actually going to be able to take care of them, provide and protect. You just liked each other. I mean, let's be honest. I liked her. She liked me. Okay, so let's get married. I mean, it might have been a little bit more than that, but you understand? The criteria wasn't exactly right. Well, she treated me so nice, or he treated me so nice. Yeah, but unless he's going where he needs to go for what you need, and he's going to take care of you in the way that you're expecting and those kind of things, you got to look for those things. Now, verse 24, but as the assembly is subject to Messiah, okay, so we, the assembly, are subject to Messiah. How are you subject to Messiah? Does Messiah just show up and ask you to do stuff? So what does that mean? So let's expand, you know, we take, let's amplify that understanding. So when we see Messiah, what else are we supposed to see? Light, truth, Torah, the word. So the assembly, can you say, can we agree that the assembly is subject to the Torah? In other words, there's a structural process expectations, obligations, and commitments expected in relation to Messiah, and we choose to submit ourselves or subject ourselves to that, because the way we submit ourselves to the Father is we don't know a whole lot about the Father except what we know through the Son. The Son says, if you've seen me, you've seen him. That's how you know about him. What do we know about him? Well, he died for us, and now he's been resurrected. Yeah, but that's everybody knows that. What do we know about him? Ah, the Torah. And how that's light. And how it brings light into the darkness. And we know the difference between darkness and light now. All through Messiah. And that's Ephesians chapter 2. You were once in darkness and now you're in light because of the love of Messiah. Bringing you and calling you and drawing you out of it. So now ladies. It says because the husband is the head and you're suggesting yourself to your own husbands. You're doing this. As the assembly is subject to Messiah, so also let the wives be to their own husbands in every respect. So that means that the husband, now let's go back to the Messiah for a second. The Messiah is the Torah. What does Torah do? Blesses you and keeps you safe and helps you transform. Guess what the role of the husband is? To bless you, keep you safe, and help you transform. We're going to see that in the rest of the verses here. And husbands are all dropping the ball like crazy here. So the husbands are all like, amen, amen. Yeah, what are you doing your stuff? Oh, you're like what I'm saying to your wives right now. But are you doing, are you actually providing? Are you blessing them? Are you keeping them safe? Do your wives feel safe, secure, provided for? Are they driving a car they're worried isn't going to make it down the road? Are they afraid that something is going to bust in the house and they won't be able to replace it? Are they... Are they living with any anxiety and fears because you haven't provided for them the safety and security emotionally to know that they're taken care of and whatever goes wrong, it can be handled? Because a lot of you are thinking, oh yeah, she needs to look at me like this. Well, you need to be like Messiah. Now it does say here, before we switch to the men in verse 25. So you're doing this, ladies, as the assembly is subject to Messiah, you also are to be subject to your husbands in every respect. That means every aspect of the household. Ladies, don't tell your husbands that you, they don't have a say in how you raise the kids. They have a say in everything. Ladies, don't tell them they don't have a say in how the money gets dealt with because you're better at handling money, whatever. They have a say in it. Ladies, don't tell them they don't. Every respect. Now the ladies are thinking that everything's gonna go down the tubes real fast if I do that. Guys, they shouldn't feel that way, guys. Why, why are you not doing what you need to do, learning what you need to do, studying it, figuring it out, practicing it, getting training so that the ladies are not afraid you're gonna dro- drop the ball and the whole thing's gonna go whoosh, right down the drain. But sure, this starts off with the ladies. But the ladies are like, sure, Rabbi, I get it, but have you seen my husband? <laughs> Can you, have you seen what I'm dealing with? 
Again, of course, you picked him. So I, I want to hear all that. All right? So we should be clear now before I get to the men. Ladies, these men need to be treated with respect in all these areas. And by the way, that goes back to our honor and shame teaching. The number one thing that men need, okay, is to feel respected. And you don't understand. Well, I don't understand why you got so upset because you don't understand that what you did was disrespectful. All right? But in your mind, it was a small thing. It's going to go the other way too, ladies. Don't worry. You're going to get your, your, your help there because when you have your something happen and the man thinks it wasn't a big deal but it made you feel unsafe and insecure and he doesn't understand why you're all upset because he thinks it wasn't a big deal. Guys, you need to understand it's a big deal. Ladies, you need, you need to, both sides need to understand what is a big deal to the other one. All right? You need to understand that. And we're going to get to that here in a second. But ladies, let's make sure we're clear as we wrap up with you and we then shift to the men that this is not debatable. This isn't women's lib. This isn't some other, other thing. You're not a second-class citizen, though. You are the highest valued living being to that man. All right? In every aspect. But you got to let him lead. And you have to submit and subject yourself to that man in every area. Uh, That's brutally hard. Especially because societally, remember what I talked about? You could be behaving a certain way for 30, 40 years and you're not going to change it in a week? This whole thing with the way wives and husbands are behaving has been going the wrong way for a very long time. I don't know, almost in the garden we may have seen something. I mean, think about what happened right there. I believe, other teachers don't agree with me, I believe Adam was right there. And his wife decides to go talk to a stranger. Adam, of course, lets her, says nothing. She doesn't turn to him for any guidance, makes her own decisions. And so both of them drop the ball completely, you know? So I can't blame one more than the other, except for the guys, wait till we get to you, because you're higher up the chain, guess who gets more blame? The higher up you go, the more you are at fault. Do you understand that? The teacher gets a double judgment. Why? Because the teacher has higher responsibility. It's like, it's like I've told wives, I've told moms, whatever your children are doing, you need to own that. What do you mean I need to own it? I never taught them to act like that, but you let them. They're where they are partially because you let them be where they are. All right? All right? Own that. And then the father, you have to say the same thing. You let your wife do all the stuff, you don't get involved, then you can't get that upset about what she's doing because you've let her do all that stuff because you didn't get involved. Well, you know, I work all the time and I don't have to. Well, listen, you got to figure it out. Because I don't, there's no excuses. Nowhere in here does it say, well, unless you're too busy or are holding down three jobs or whatever. There's no exceptions to these rules. Did anybody find the exceptions chapter? Okay. Torah doesn't have any exceptions. This whole thing doesn't have any exceptions. Now, you do have an out, you could get a divorce. But if you're going to be in, then be in. Men. (laughs) Hi, guys. Husbands, love your wives. I love my wife. Okay, but wait, wait. Love your wives as Messiah also did love the assembly and gave himself for it. This goes back to that providing thing. Have you sacrificed so she can have? There's a bunch of you out there that could do more or spend less and your wife could be home. Okay? And that, that would be, you know, and by the way, ladies, nowhere in scripture, nowhere does it say that you, as the weaker vessel and everything else we're going to talk about here in a minute, that we are obligated to allow you to just have a life where you sit home and do nothing. That's not anywhere. You go back as far as you go back, the ladies were busy. 
If the guys were out shepherding, the ladies were gardening and, and doing the, the crops, okay? The ladies worked. I mean, when, when um, Abraham sent his servant to find Isaac a wife, guess what the ladies were doing in that family? They were tending the well. Same thing when Moses shows up, right? And the daughters were there of Yithro. They were tending the flock. Okay, so ladies, nowhere does it say that you have a princess or prince or queen future here. Okay? If you're home, there's things to do. And I'm not just talking about making sure that everything is dishes are washed and laundry is done. You should be doing something that has to do with how can I help my husband? How can I help my husband? And ladies, I've said this in the past. I need to say it again. It is not helpful if he doesn't think it's helpful. Well, I do all those things. I do all these things for him. But is that what he wants you to do for him? How about asking? You know, I teach the shamashim, the, 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 the servants of the body, that when they do things, they should be asking, is this what you wanted? Okay, we take all the chairs out, we reset them up, and because we had to make more room and reconfigure them to handle more people, and then the question then becomes, they bring me in and say, Rabbi, is this what you wanted? Not, is this what I wanted, meaning them. They can't just do it the way they think, even though it may work, but they should find out, is this what the person who's in charge wants? So you should be asking on a regular basis, sweetheart, what do you need? What can I do for you? How can I be of help to you? Ladies, one of the ways you can be of help is let's increase your awareness of what they're doing and whether they need you just to give them space so to let them finish what they're doing. Instead of interrupting what they're doing because you have a project. Okay? Yeah, but mine's more important. Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Give him that choice. Say, excuse me, I see you're already busy with something. I had this other thing. I just wanted to let you know in case you maybe want to choose to redirect or whatever. But let them choose. That's respectful. I know we all can agree when we watch the news that society has gone to a total disarray of disrespect. I mean, there's just no respect for any authority. That is why they broke into the White House, I mean, into the Congress, right? They broke into the Capitol. It was just to show disrespect. They, we could just walk in here and walk around. I mean, I don't think it was a coup attempt. It was just a bunch of disrespectful people wanting to go in, and they walked around mostly with their cameras, taking pictures and saying, look where I am. Okay? But it's disrespectful. All right? Sitting in a chair you're not supposed to sit in unless you have that title. But we do a lot of stuff that's disrespectful. The children, whoa, we're always like, oh, look how disrespectful the children are. But how are you as a wife? And then we're going to get to the husbands here again in a second. So men, love your wives. <clears throat> well, I do love my wife. No, no, as Messiah loved the assembly. Okay, now, listen to the rest of the sentence, though, ladies, because you're all like, yeah, my husband needs to love me. Let's understand what it looks like, though, according to this. As Messiah loved the assembly, what did Messiah do for the assembly? He made sure they had everything they needed. Gave them guidance and instruction and was willing to die for them. Bless, keep safe. Now there's more to it. Listen to the rest. Now the husbands, you're going to do this in order to set the wife apart and cleanse her with the washing by the water of the word or of the water by the word in order to present the whole relationship here to, this is what Messiah did to the assembly, but you're doing the same thing. In order to present it to himself, a splendid assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of this sort, but that it might be set apart and blameless. So you husbands, not, not you ladies, but you husbands, you have the corrective role. Oh, we got this upside down and backwards in the body and everywhere else. Ladies, there's no scripture that says you were there to correct your husbands. The scripture says they're there to correct you, to instruct you so that you can be presented blameless. Now guys, if you have no clue how to do that, well, you need to get guidance, go up the chain, go up the vertical structure, okay? But husbands will love their wives as Messiah did. Messiah loved the assembly, corrected the assembly, guided the assembly, provided the assembly with everything it could need to successfully journey into the place where they can be without spot, without spot or wrinkle or any sort. 
blameless. Now, a lot of you guys out there, you abdicate all that stuff. You just let them run the house any way they want or do this any way they want because you just can't be bothered with it. I got enough on my plate. Then you should have got married. You got married, all of it came on your plate. Everything that happens in that marriage, in that house, in your children is you. That is on you. Period. Okay? You want respect? Then grab a hold of your responsibility and be responsible for everything. Own it. Well, it's my wife. Then own that. What are you doing? Are you providing? Are you protecting? Are you blessing? Are you setting the right example? Are you giving the right correction? And by the way, ladies, you're going to have to take correction. He's not going to tell me what to do. You're not going to get anywhere. He said, in this way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Does anybody remember some verses where it talks about bringing your body into subjection? Disciplining your body? Who said that? Paul. These are his phrases. He uses the same phrases when he's talking to the Philippians as to the Ephesians or the the Galatians or the Colossians. So you know when he says, love them as your own body, and we're told to bring our body into discipline and subjection. Ladies, I hate to say it. Now, I know it's true of the men too, but you're very undisciplined because you're more emotionally driven than the men. So you have a tendency to run off in different directions more than the men. Not that the men can't. We've got a lot of men that tend to think that they're women. Okay, they act like that. They run off and their emotions are driving everything. And I look at them like, I want to smack them and say, man up. Actually, I've said that quite a few times. Okay, anybody remember the, um, that mo- the baseball movie uh, with a, with a, for the girls' baseball teams, right? And what the guy said, he says, there's no crying in baseball. Men, stop your whining. Get your thumb out of your mouth. Change your diaper. Stand on your hind legs with your back straight and man up. Okay? And then you're going to come to me and all crying and upset going, well, I don't know what to do. Well, figure it out. Why are you yelling at us? I don't know what else to do. You're not listening. Figure it out. All the resources you could ever want are there, including asking somebody to mentor you. But mentor you doesn't mean to take you out with a baby bottle and put it in your mouth and hold you while you drink. You're a grown man. Figure it out. This isn't rocket science. If you make X dollars an hour, and at the end of the month, you don't have enough money to pay your bills, I don't know, maybe you need to make make X plus something dollars an hour. Well, I don't know how to do anything else. Go learn how to do something else. Well, I'm 45 years old. Well, next year you'll be 46 and broke. And stupid. I'm being serious. If you already figured out at 45 the problem and you're 46, you haven't done anything to do it, then you're also stupid. And that's, I mean, are you not, are you not tired of being stupid? I don't know what to do. Really. And don't, whatever excuse you have, I can, I, I've studied this enough, I can point you to people that have, t- have testimonies that had situations exactly like yours or worse, and somehow they figured it out. So don't give me your, well, I'm old, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I have this problem, I, I have a disability here, I've got the, stop it. It doesn't matter what you say, somebody with the same thing figured it out. Stop making excuses. You know, because I've got some people coming up to me lately who are trying to figure out how to lead and be, be a man and everything else they need to be, but they, they come to me asking me just to basically somehow spoon feed it and make it happen. It's like, no, it's got to come from in here. Ladies, the same thing. If you're going to be a wife, 
the preference problem in here, okay? You need to get to the place. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about, some of you don't. I call it the Scarlett O'Hara moment. If you saw Gone with the Wind, that moment she's standing up there on the hill and the sun is, well, actually, it's the burning of the city. You can see in the back, so it looks like the sky is all red. And she says, as God is my witness, my family will never starve again. Now, it's not the line she said. She had an internal change and said, this is done and over and will never happen again. Now, don't act like her. She was willing to beg, borrow, steal, and cheat to get what she wanted later. But the point is, she got to that place where she said, I've had enough of being here. Men, you've got to get there. Ladies, same thing. You gotta get to the place where I am done being in, the, you've circled around this mountain long enough, Yahweh said to Moses. Anybody circling a mountain too long? But that has to snap. You have to have that change in here that says, I've had enough. This has got to change. And don't just walk over to someone and say, I don't know what to do. Of course you don't know what to do. You know, my parents never were entrepreneurs. They had jobs and they went to college and all these things. And then I decided I wanted to go a different way. You know how, how much help I had with that? Zero. I made lots of mistakes, but you know what I did? I figured it out. I made lots of mistakes, had some successes, studied, paid for seminars, went to read lots of books, went to, I mean, I figured it out. How? By trying to figure it out. By start, you start with one piece of information, it leads you to another one, leads you to another one, and you figure it out. I taught my son this indirectly. When he was really young, we used to get him these Lego kits that would make a certain thing, right? So it was a kit to make that one thing. And he was great at following the picture directions, but every now and then, at the beginning of it, somewhere in there, he would get stuck. And he asked me for help, and I said, well, I'm busy right now, I'll be right there. But I would be busy and be slow, and by the time I went over there, guess what? He figured it out. Every time. I never helped him with one of them. Not because I ignored him. By the time I, and it wasn't that long, but he was determined to do it and wasn't going to wait forever, so he figured it out. Ladies, you struggle the same way. I don't know how to be a submissive wife. Well, you have to figure it out, or you're going to always have a problem in your house. This is your reality. So now it says, husbands, in this, this way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but feeds and cherishes it, and also the, as the master does the assembly. This is really the key. Ladies, you're expecting too much from these guys and not enough at the same time. In other words, you're expecting the wrong things. And the things you're expecting, I know they're not providing all of those, but they should be there to lead you, guide you, protect you, keep you safe, and bless you with overflowing joy in life. But they, they're not going to do it the way you want, necessarily, okay? You don't get to tell them how it should all be done and everything. That, you can't, you're not going to drive the bus, okay? So women, you're like blue in your life. You're like the blue in his life, even if you're not blue, because you want to drive. And you have to let him drive. You're going to have to trust him. Well, I don't like the way he drives. Well, why'd you marry him then? Well, I didn't know I needed to figure that out before I got married. Well, now you know, Okay? He says, because we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. He says, this is a great secret, but I speak concerning Messiah in the assembly. However, you too, every one of you, let each one love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she fears her husband. So what is the husband supposed to do? Love the wife. Love your wives. How do you love them? Make sure they're taken care of, provided for, and safe and all their needs are met. That's what Messiah did for us. Messiah doesn't necessarily come to you and give you all kinds of warm fuzzies and everything else. He's making sure you have everything that you need. Now men, you can give them a lot more than that, okay? But ladies, fear, wow. The wife, let the wife see that she fears her husbands. Lady, you don't fear any, ladies, you do not fear your husbands. You're not afraid of them, you're not, that awe and reverence for them, none of that's there. And a lot of you ladies, 
and you wonder why your house is such a mess. But I don't like the way he's doing everything. Okay, I'm sorry, verse 34. Unless your husband is doing stuff you don't like. Some of you just actually looked at your book and realized there's no verse 34. Okay? There's no exceptions here. Look, are we going to get this or not? All right? And by the way, all of you are in the same boat. None of you is great at this. All of you struggle at this, and I get that. But if we're ever going to get past that, here's your answers that you always say, well, the, let's go to the Torah. See what the, this is what it says. Okay? And by the way, we didn't get to read there, but in 1 Peter, it says exactly the same thing, essentially. All right? It says in verse 1 in 1 Peter 3, in the same way, wives, be subject to your husbands, your own husbands, so that if any are disobedient to the word, they without a word might be won over because of the behavior of their wives, having seen your blameless behavior and fear. So ladies, this says that even if your husbands are screw-ups, you still do your job right and you may win them over because they see that you're doing your job right. Not you're walking a Torah perfect, that you're being a wife correctly. Let's understand 1 Peter 3 correctly. In the same ways, be subject to your husbands, okay, so that if any are disobedient to the word, they, without a word, might be won over by the behavior of their wives, having seen your blameless behavior in fear. Ladies, you read this verse all wrong because the church taught it to you all wrong. The main point here is the ladies do what you're supposed to do no matter what he does. That doesn't mean you have to stay if it's so bad that you don't want to stay. But if you're going to stay, let him have his position and do your thing. And stop with, well, if he would change, I would change. No, doesn't say that. You need to do what you need to do. That's what it says. Now, you can argue with the word if you want. Not a very smart idea, but you could. All right? Okay, so I just want to make sure that we're clear in that section. Of course, this goes um, in, in 1 Peter, it goes all the way from verse 1 to 7. I didn't read all that, but I hit the main point that I wanted to hit. Let's go before the Father. Father, we come before you. And Father, we are, we struggle. We really do struggle. And you know that. You watch us and you see how we struggle. And we know marriage is from you. That we know it's from you because we know that you use the metaphor of marriage for so many things, including the relationship that we have with you and the wedding and supper of the Lamb that we're looking forward to. And so we do understand when you talk about the bride and the bridegroom and these things. But Father, we are just struggling. And it's because of our flesh, it's because we are not heavenly and spiritually minded and above minded, but still we're fleshly and below minded and earthly minded. And we're still too well practiced in the ways of the world as opposed to the ways of, 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 of you, the, your ways. So Father, be patient with us, please, and, and help us to figure it out. <laughs> Guide us to sources and things that could help us to figure it out. We know it's, 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 it's not the instruction that's complicated. We don't need help figuring out what you say. It's implementing what you say that's so hard. We can read the verses and understand what you're saying. But because of society and the world and the way we were raised for all these thousands of years, it's very, it's very challenging for us to implement what you say. So Father, we thank you that you have the, given us the word. We thank you for the opening up of our hearts and our minds and ask that you would continue to help us to recognize when it's our preferences that are driving and not our intellect that our conscious decisions need to not be driven by other factors, but by reason and logic, because we have chosen with reason and logic to submit ourselves to you and to covenant with you. So Father, we just want to come to you now, recognizing the relationship as shown us by you through Messiah to the assembly, and ask that you would help us to imitate that in our lives. So we thank you. And we praise you and give you all glory and honor in the name above all names, Yeshua our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Amen.